We're going to go ahead and get started. Can people in the back row hear me? Wave if you can hear me. OK, great, great. Well, welcome. I'm Bess Marcus. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health here at Brown. And we're delighted to have all of you for what's going to be a very exciting and sobering and uplifting and all kinds of emotions um, I'm sure we'll be sharing this afternoon. So we're really honored to host today's event, Giving Birth in America, which is a documentary film series produced by Every Mother Counts. Every Mother Counts is an organization founded by Christy Turlington Burns in 2010 to improve maternal health and re reduce maternal mortality. It's kind of unfathomable for me to be saying that the United States has a rising maternal mortality rate. So just think about that sentence, you know, that we are increasing in a direction that so much many other places in the world have figured out how to, how to decrease. So U.S. maternal mortality rate more than doubled between 1991 and 2004. Over 700 women die each year from complications related to pregnancy, and that's in the U.S., and two-thirds of those deaths are seen as preventable. 50,000 women also suffer from life-threatening complications of pregnancy. A report from the Commonwealth Fund released last December found American women have the highest risk of dying from pregnancy complications among 11 high-income countries. And what's worse is that there are massive disparities. Our School of Public Health is all about health equity and equity for all. And there are major disparities in who dies during childbirth. Black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women, and that's regardless of their education, their income le level, or other socioeconomic factors. So you will hear much more about this alarming trend from Christy Turlington Burns and our experts from the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute, Drs. Patrick Vivier and Drs. Erica Warner. So the School of Public Health is really pleased to partner with Every Mother Counts and Hassenfeld Child Health Institute to address the urgent challenges to maternal health. And you know we focus a lot on maternal and child health, and as Christy will tell you more about this organization, Every Mother Counts is really about the mom's piece, right? And that's about the mom's giving birth and the mom's helping children thrive after birth. So I'd like to turn things over to Christy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, yes, I would say that uh, I like to say that I became a maternal um, health uh, advocate the day that I became a mom and my daughter is turning 16 next week so it's it's been um, it's been a long journey so far <laughs> um, but one that has had a lot of um, progress um, which is the part we like to focus on the what is possible because um, I think for as, as surprising and as shocking as it's just the statistics are in the US and around the world there is so much that can be done um, there's so much that we already know how to do so I think focusing on that um, now and before the film and then hopefully after in our conversation will be an important thing and I think more inspiring than some of the things you've been reading in the paper um, so when I became a mom in 2003 the global statistics were that 530,000 or so girls and women were dying every year and that those numbers around the world and that those numbers had not budged in decades decades. Um, the U.S. was ranked 41st at that time. Um, today, we are ranked um, 55th. In fact, the WHO just released a report a couple of weeks ago um, that we have fallen behind even further. But in the middle point of 2003 and today, um, we were lingering around 46th for some time. And so as I as I got involved in this work, had my children, um, got exposed to global health first, actually, before I started looking at the United States, um, I was traveling around the world with a few different NGOs, CARE, um, the One Campaign, um, Save the Children, and was learning and seeing all of these different examples around the world where, um, where ratios were changing and where there was a sort of building excitement around Millennium Development Goals and where even when maternal and infant child health was lagging the most, there was sort of, there was a bit of like a, a, a kind of rise in political will and people's commitments to addressing the issue um, around the world. Um, so I made a documentary film. I went back to school um, to study public health at Mailman at Columbia 
and I started a film at the same time, and that film was called No Woman, No Cry, and it came out in 2010, which was the halfway point between the beginning of Millennium Development Goals and the end, and it was really an important time, I would say, to putting faces and voice to the statistics that the world was starting to talk about um, a little bit more frequently and a little bit uh, at a little higher level. Um, and that film, uh, I mean, we've had to update the statistics several times now because the numbers keep changing either in, in both directions, right? The U.S. has gotten progressively worse, and then other countries like Bangladesh, Tanzania, Guatemala have gotten a little bit better. Um, and so when I made that film, I traveled around the world, showed it to many, many audiences, and many of those audiences would ask me afterwards, or they would just point out that the U.S. was the most shocking of all. And nobody was surprised to hear that Sub-Saharan Africa was um, the place where the highest instances of maternal death occurred. They were not surprised to hear that in Southeast Asia that there were high instances of maternal mortality. Um, they were not particularly surprised that in Guatemala, women did not have access to care. But in the United States, People just couldn't get their head around that, and they still can't, because I talk to audiences every day um, about this issue. So that questioning um, and that interest is what got me to start this series, Giving Birth in America. In the first film, No Woman, No Cry, the U.S. is a part of that film, but it's kind of interstitial, and um, I share my own birth story, which is... Um, Oh, I didn't even share that with you guys yet. I meant to say that when I said that I became a maternal mortality um, advocate that day. So my daughter, um, after she was born, after a really fairly straightforward pregnancy and uh, a delivery, which was exactly as I planned and what I wanted, um, I hemorrhaged. Um, it didn't happen immediately. It happened after some time. I just didn't progress into the fourth stage of labor. Um, I had a midwife uh, in, as my provider and a backing OB who very much respected midwifery, um, and my choices to deliver in a birth center in a hospital. And he came in as things got a little bit um, more uh, dramatic, I would say. I lost a few liters of blood, not enough to have a, um, a transfusion. Um, I was able to stay in the birthing center and, and, and have everybody like work with me and my family um, through the experience, and I was fine. Um, but it was really... That experience, I think the, the pain that I experienced, um, the confusion, um, but also the, the relief and the, the, the gratitude I felt for the team that I did have. And I felt very fortunate to be in the care of um, people who understood my own history, understood my own, um, you know, what was important to me. And they were able to address the situation and then work together, most importantly, as a team to address um, what was happening to, to me. Um, so skip to the film and learning about the global statistics um, and then making uh, the U.S. series Giving Birth in America. It just became after about five years of, of the organization starting with this you know, storytelling component that was very central to our core um, mission, the idea of elevating women's voices, um, the mothers, but also the people who care for them, right? The, the, the nurses, the midwives, the doctors, um, the family members, right? Like, I, we start with the woman always, but there's these sort of, you know, concentric circles that um, come into her, into her world that make such a huge difference in the ultimate um, uh, outcomes of her pregnancy and her delivery. Um, so the first three films we created to get, um, in 2015 with the idea that the 2016 elections were coming up and we wanted maternal health to be something to be talked about more um, during that election. We never got there. I think we didn't think we had to because one of the people in that election was already quite committed to the um, to women and children and to women's health. Um, so those three f films came out. We looked at um, maternity care in Montana, in New York, and in Florida, two of those states being states where we had grantee partners and we sort of focused on their programs and what was working for them. Um, and then once the election happened, we went back to make some more. Um, we did the next film in Louisiana, and then we made the fifth one in California, and that's one we're going to show today. And I will share a little bit more about what's happening next after this film. Um, but really the idea is to continue to take... Um, to take a look and really to listen to um, women and families and providers that are going through it 
so that you can see the challenges or the barriers that people face every day when trying to access um, quality, respectful, um, culturally appropriate maternity care. Um, and hopefully we bring up the, the important piece, which is the what is possible through the stories that you're going to see today and the conversations that we're going to have afterwards. Thank you so much. I mean, I was pretty much one of those kids when I was younger that I had said I wanted to be a doctor. Being from a small rural community myself, not really knowing what exactly it was that I needed to do to get there. And so I think just having the inspiration of seeing what my parents went through to provide a good life for me and my brothers was one of the biggest driving forces. Room for one more. Sure. And get a little of this action. Ya voy a cumplir en junio nueve años de estar aquí en Guatemala. Yo trabajo en la pesca de la fresa. Cuando yo traje a mis hijos aquí, me presioné mucho. Pues hay que apoyarlos en lo que se pueda. Ay, ay, ay. Pero con la nueva administración, todo tenso. Luego a veces que te despiertas en la noche a las dos de la mañana. Supone que cuando ya estás en las últimas semanas es cuando más relajada tienes que estar, cuando más tranquila, que ya anda la migra aquí, que ya anda la migra acá. Y pues a veces hasta tiene un miedo ir al doctor. Watsonville, the city that the clinic resides in, is about 50,000 people, and about 27,000 of them are patients of Salud. About 40% of our patients are farm workers. 90% or more are Hispanic. Having a medical home where a patient can walk in safely and securely and feel confident that no matter what their immigration status is, no matter where they fall on the poverty level, that they're going to get good care. Dr. Kang is there with Yadira, with Christina. In our Department of Women's Health, we really have emphasized a collaborative approach. They can see a nurse practitioner, they can see midwives, they can see physician assistants. See? It's really important when you work in a community that is predominantly Hispanic that the staff, they're bilingual or have some familiarity with the culture. I've been working at this hospital for 30 years. I talk to my patients as much as possible because they sometimes they look at me and say, oh, but you wouldn't understand, you lived here. And I said, no, I was born in Mexico. That fear of, is anyone going to ask me questions that they'd be fearful to answer, really does get blunted when they're in a safe place and they are familiar with some of the faces that help them navigate through that system. On the way here from Mexico, my mom was nine months pregnant at the time. We ran out of food and we had no money. And all we ate was bread and mayo and water. So for many years, I could not stand mayo. My siblings still can't eat mayo. When I hear people in society say, go back to Mexico, or immigrants don't deserve the right to health care, the right to work, or the right to be here, I take that personal. Let me get her. And I take it personal because I'm from a family of immigrants. <laughs> Dr. Gambo. Amber is on the phone for you. Okay. And I transferred the call, but you were too quick and you came out of the room. Oh. That's how you transferred it, so I'll transfer it again. I can give you a little bit of a clinical history about her. She does have some other comorbidities that you guys might want to know about. I come from generations of farm workers migrating between Mexico and California. Okay. I like how we have tortillas in there. I was fortunate that I had parents that, even in the work of being farm workers, 
As a child in our household, it was very palpable how much they valued learning what the issues were and advocating for the farm worker population. It wasn't just something that they saw on TV or that they read about, but it was something they actually experienced. The importance of serving and being a part of a community. And them relaying that to me just made me feel like it was also my fight to have as well. ¿Y no tenía alguna complicación durante el tiempo de su otro parto? No. No? Okay. ¿Quiere ayudarme para, para medir el estómago? Okay. Ok, so vamos a quitar todo esto, ¿no? Vas a sentir en la mesa. Uno, dos, tres. Okay. Porque usted va a usar una doctora en la apertura, ¿sí? Ok. Se pone. Trae su mano y pone aquí. Exacto. ¿Y piensa que vas a regresar el, el fil cuando, después de este embarazo? Sí, sí voy a regresar porque como el único que sabe no trabajar y pues tienen que trabajar también para mantener la familia. Mm -hmm. Sí. Sometimes it's a challenge because when their husbands are working in the field all day and every hour, every minute that they're in the field means money for their household, a lot of times my patients won't be able to make it to those appointments. And so we just try to get as crafty as we can to make sure that we're, we're providing the best care and that moms have the options that any other mom would have. met this one patient about four years ago and she had revealed to me at that time that she was wanting to get pregnant and she didn't know exactly why she couldn't get pregnant. Que me compraba pruebas, pruebas cada mes y me salían negativas. Que ahora sí como dijéramos que mi abuelita dice, no, pues que dale opciones al marido. Le di una docena, al siguiente día le di otra docena y pues nada, mes con mes, con mes, y mes, y mes, y pues nada. I knew of her surgical history of having two C-sections before, and that was just my initial kind of snippet of meeting her. Cuando yo tuve mi último bebé, este, mi niño este de 13 años, yo lo tuve en México. Como me hicieron cesárea, este, pues yo decía todo, los dolores es normal por la, la cirugía y todo. Me regresé para preguntar en el hospital, a ver mi expediente, a ver qué había pasado y todo. Y pues no había nada de expediente que yo nunca había aliviado, nunca me había aliviado ahí, nunca había tenido a mi niño ahí. Ya hasta después, ya cuando me vine para acá fue cuando supe que estaba ligada. She had asked me about what the option was to have that surgery reversed and unfortunately we don't have the specialist or resources here. Porque ninguna aseguranza ni medical ni nada me cubriría para eso. Me salía en como 10 mil dólares la operación. Entonces busqué por internet y, y encontré una clínica que me cobró 5 mil 800. Pero, pero sí fue traumante. El sueño de mi mamá de tener más hijos, después de tanto esfuerzo, se le puede hacer realidad. Bueno, ya está mejor, ya está mejor, porque antes ya estaba creciendo bastante. We knew going into the pregnancy that she was going to have a higher risk for having diabetes. <coughs> o sea, yo quería intentar, uh, por eso estaba uh, proponiéndome uh, controlar el azúcar uh -huh. para, este, <coughs> para poder intentar aliviarme normal. Uh -huh. Para este, pues, ya ve que yo batallé por mi operación uh -huh. y todo eso, uh -huh. pero ya no tomo coca. Okay. Ya le bajé la tortilla, ya okay. no como pan. Bueno, sí como pan de vez en cuando. Ajá. Uh -huh. O un pan a la semana. Ajá, uh -huh. qué bueno. Pero ya. No todo el tiempo. No. So it's a Having a diagnosis of gestational diabetes, it changes the course of the pregnancy. Initially, it was a matter of telling her, instead of two tortillas, one tortilla. Honestamente, honestamente, no guardaba la dieta que debía de guardar. <laughs> Ay, es que es imposible que me vaya a llenar sin comerme ni una tortilla. Mm. 
Más tortilla, don Martín. Salgo embarazada, pues ya no me tocó, ya no pude yo trabajar. Tengo pues bastantes primos solteros, tíos y pues no quieren cocinar. Nos echamos la mano unos con otros. Si no podemos ayudarnos, ahora sí como dijéramos, con dinero o así, pues por lo menos, ¿sabes qué? Como en este caso me dicen, tú cocíname y yo te pago. Lo que voy a gastar en otro lado, mejor te los pago a ti y pues te alivianas y, y nos alivianas, como dijéramos. Pues ya que me alivie y tenga mi bebé, pues ya, a ver qué pasa, dependiendo las, las cosas. It's really easy to pass judgment on what people deserve or don't deserve. But when you pass by the fields in Watsonville and people are hunched over picking 12 hours a day and running with boxes just to earn one extra dollar, it's really hard to have any thoughts where you think that that person's not deserving of something that everyone else is getting. Corazón. As changes are made to take away health care, It's very scary for not just patients, but also providers. El medio tiempo puedes chequear Facebook, Instagram. We've made leaps and bounds to provide more access to health care. And what I'm fearful of as an OBGYN in this state is that there won't be a return to the progress that had been made in the prior years. And that there'll be the continued fear placed in patients of not feeling that they can go get health care in their community and that they'll neglect their health care because they don't feel that that's an option for them anymore. Once that starts to happen, I think we're really going to see a shift in our maternal mortality and morbidity. And that's heartbreaking. Mira, como por ejemplo, me chequeó el azúcar primero con este aparatito, con esta cosita, este es mi juguetito. Pero todavía no me la voy a chequear porque faltan 15 minutos y luego me va a salir más alta de por sí. Tengo que miedo que me va a salir alta. Faltan. Mi abuelito falleció de diabetes. Mis tías todas tienen diabetes. Mi mamá lo tiene. Pues no es que me asuste, pero digo, ahorita no es el momento de que, de que yo tuviera por, por mi embarazo, ¿verdad? Pero, pero que sí. ¿Dónde le vas a avisar a la tuca del, del baby shower? La semana que entra. Hay que ir a preguntar ahí. ¿No preguntaste? No. Durante todo el, el embarazo, los siete, ocho meses atrás, yo nunca tuve la presión alta. Nunca. ¿Por qué? Porque yo podía este, que ya hacía mis pagos, que ya pagaba mi, mi teléfono, mi aseguranza, todo. No tenía ningún estrés de nada. Nos falta el letrero del baby shower. Mi tiempo me alcanzaba, todo estaba bien. Pero ya cuando ya, ya no pude, ya no pude, ya no pude, y se me cargó y se me cargó y se me cargó. Mucho estrés, mucho, demasiado era atrae la presión alta y alta y alta y pues ya no la pude controlar. When someone gets a diagnosis like diabetes or high blood pressure in pregnancy, the other big component is for other potential diseases to also occur while they're pregnant. As her diabetes started to require more management, as her blood pressures were starting to increase, and she was around 36 weeks at that time, she had then just said, you know, I, I would like to just plan for a C-section. And so we had made that plan to be at 39 weeks. Uno como mujer ya sientes los cambios de tu cuerpo. Yo tenía mi cita con la doctora de la azúcar. Dos días antes yo sentía mi cuerpo raro, diferente. Llegué a la clínica y entonces me pasaron a chequearme la presión. No pasaron ni cinco minutos cuando entró la doctora Cristina Gamboa. Ella entró. Yo así como que, hmm, algo, 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 algo está pasando. It was very timely. One of our midwives who were seeing her in the clinic called me while I was on call and discussed with me her blood pressures being newly elevated above what they had been. 
y dijo, este, yo te recomiendo, recomendaría que hiciéramos la cesárea lo más pronto posible. She then ultimately had the diagnosis of preeclampsia by having high protein levels in her urine and then with her blood pressure. Preeclampsia can be pretty severe. They can go on to have a complication called eclampsia, which is seizures associated with blood pressure. Just like diabetes, you can walk around and feel normal and feel healthy, but it's a silent disease process that happens inside. And women can die. Nueve años de estar aquí. En México había mucha violencia. Entonces, pues más vale mejor alejarse de todo eso. Y caminamos como dos noches, pasar por, por el cerro. Pues de hecho, hasta uno de inmigración nos disparó balazos y gracias a Dios a nadie nos pegó. Pero cada sacrificio vale la pena. Me gustaría que mis hijos no terminaran en el campo como yo, tuvieran una carrera, tener un, un mejor futuro para ellos. Más que nada, todo el tiempo nosotros los papás siempre pedimos lo mejor para los hijos. My hometown in Central California, it's about three and a half hours straight east of here. It's a primarily, largely agricultural community. It's where I was born and raised. My father, since the 80s, he and some other gentlemen created a boxing group for at-risk youth. About eight, Kevin Perez. It gives me an opportunity to see my family and bond with them in a very unique way, but it also just reinforces to me the sense of community. I go back to a community that I went to high school in and show the kids who are local from there that they too can aspire to do great things and leave and always come back. Hello, my name is Patrick Vivier. I'm the director of the Hassenfeld Child Health Innovation Institute and also the uh, concentration advisor for the maternal and child health concentration at the MPH program at the School of Public Health. Um, we'd like to move to our next phase, which is the discussion page, stage, and we'll ask uh, Christy to come up along with Dr. Erica Werner. Um, to uh, Erica will, will be able to introduce herself uh, for us to be able to start addressing some of the questions uh, that you might have, but first talking about a couple of the key topics. <laughs> so my name's Erica Werner. I'm the Division Director of Maternal Fetal Medicine at Women and Infants, um, and also uh, Associate Professor at the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine for Brown. I'm also one of the researchers for the Hassenfeld Institute um, and uh, on the Executive Committee, um, and do a lot of research particularly focused on diabetes in pregnancy and how that affects maternal morbidity and mortality. Great. 
Um, so I thought we'd start with a couple questions to get started and then we'll open up to the audience. Um, the first one is to kind of address some of the issues brought up by Dean Marcus. Um, and before we do that, I do want to say thank you to Christy for coming um, for this film, for the work of focusing on this in horrifying issue that, that really needs to be addressed. So thank you. Um, so as uh, I think Dean Marcus and I think you as well mentioned, the United States ranking 55th when we think of all the money that we spend. And not only 55th, but that's a worsening, a recent worsening. Can you address that? Why, why are we where we are? Uh, it, maybe each of you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, it's interesting, the, the very beginning when I heard we were 41st, I was quite shocked. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a process to adapt to some of that information. Um, I think the, the big things when I was a student and learning about this issue for the first time that really struck me were, I mean, first, that we have um, a lot of chronic health conditions that are on the rise, the one that we saw in the film, but others, I mean, ob obesity, hypertension, those are certainly making an impact that is unique in the United States to some of the other countries that um, where we're, we've invested in solutions. Um, the other one is that, you know, one in, five women of reproductive age have uh, insurance coverage. And that's also shocking, and our system is unique to any other system on the planet. Um, and then the, the, the thing that I think we've gotten a lot more attention around most recently, but it would always be sort of the, the last thing mentioned, and I'm saying it last now, but is the racial disparities. Um, and we would say it last only because there was certainly a lot of evidence and data to prove that there was this disproportionate um, number of women who were experiencing complications or, you know, of course, death being the worst outcome. Um, but some health departments were starting to see it. Like, you would see this sort of spotty data collection across the country. There was really inconsistent reporting from state to state. And so people would sort of mention it, like it was the elephant in the room, but nobody would go further. Mm -hmm. And I think in the last couple of years, what's been um, exciting um, about the additional media attention and the stories that have been um, that have been rising to the surface is that it's something that we can't really look away from. It should be the first thing that we talk about, um, even if we can't answer every aspect okay. of the problem. But to say that there are um, there are there is um, implicit bias um, in almost every institution in our country. Um, women report constantly that they're, st they're, they're not listened to, that they're ignored, that they're told to leave or to go away or to shut up. <laughs> I mean, we've done a lot of research and have people on our team that have been looking at disrespectful care in, um, in hospitals um, in the U.S., but this is also a lot of research that's happening outside of the United States right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a problem and it's something that right now we can't really look away because the words have been said, and um, that's, I think, where there's the most opportunity and why I think most of us are here today to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, I, I, just to echo some of those things, um, the U.S., 50 percent, or almost 50 percent of pregnancies in the U.S. are unintended. So if you, um, women who intend to get pregnant have the opportunity for preconception counseling and to talk to their doctors and get on prenatal vitamins and all of those things. Um, you all add to that that then when about a third of women don't actually get in to see a doctor in their first trimester, um, and that has to do with all the insurance issues. Um, so the insurance issues lead to a system where we're very reactive in medicine and not very proactive. I think that can be said of the whole U.S. healthcare system, but it's particularly true for reproductive age women. We don't really put a lot of value on preconception counseling or on those early pregnancy visits. Instead, we wait until somebody gets diagnosed with gestational diabetes or has preeclampsia, and then we scramble to address those issues. Um, and I think, you know, that's there's many, many reasons for that. Some of them financial, some of them institutional, and just how we approach healthcare in the U.S. Um, and how doctors, quite frankly, approach health care. So I think, um, you know, I, I think all of these are reasons why we keep getting worse rather than better. Um, to try not to end that for the first sort of questions on that <laughs> note, how do we get to that next stage? I mean, I think you're, you're, one of the beautiful things about the film is talking about 
ways in which things can be addressed, whether that's insurance coverage and, and culturally appropriate. How do we get sensitive, culturally appropriate care for all women in the US? How do we do that? We do a lot of thinking about you know, quality care and what does that mean to people. I mean, it's very different for everyone. I mean, what's quality care to, my, to me versus to Erica? I mean, that looks very different for women of, um, in whatever community. And so I think um, elevating people's understanding of what should they demand? What what is normal? What is good? What is quality? What is high quality? Um, you can be at some of the best hospitals in this country and still be treated disrespectfully. So that's the other part that I think there's a lot of educating that needs to happen. And I think that the films really help to illustrate it. I mean, you know, I've shown this film and all of the others in different rooms. And if you have doctors in a room and they're watching different parts of this film thinking, oh, okay, I would have heard Ileana's, um, some of her story, and I would have just gone to conclusions. But when you see her at home, and when you see her with her family, and you see how hard she's worked to get where she is, and um, that her family is so supportive of her going through this step, and that it's her right. It's her right to choose this for herself, and she should have every support that any other woman um, should have. And so I think when you when you see that, and you see that in a, coll in, in a collective, in a room like this, with people with different kinds of backgrounds and experiences, um, I think that that ultimately we can walk away with the, the beginnings of where to begin. Um, and, and that really is, it's, it's, it's education at so many levels, mm -hmm. from the community to um, the healthcare providers at whichever level. Um, you know, like really there's starting to be more of an effort at teaching um, medical schools on implicit bias mm -hmm. training. Um, I think the first reaction is tends to be like, no, that's not, you know, no, not me. <laughs> but I think if you can get past that, there's so much to be learned and could continue learning um, because it's, it's too complex of an issue to think that you learn it once and you're done. And I think continued ed is, is really a big part of, of what needs to happen here amongst policymakers as well as providers as well as educators and, and you know, everyday citizens who, you know, as you say, we're not planning to become mothers when we become mothers. And so you want to you want to know as much as you can before you enter that stage of your life and go into it feeling that you have the support that you need. Um, and that, that might happen. Um, I mean, we've been very focused on it at the community level with community-based doulas, um, midwives. Um, that's what we, you know, that's the most effective um, that we've seen, the, uh, the lowest cost sol solution, although the other problem is reimbursement because um, you see better outcomes and yet people aren't being compensated for what they're contributing and the impact that they can make on the lives of women and families. Um, so trying to balance that out to some extent, um, you know, demand alone without the, you know, <laughs> without the solutions in place. In your perspective as a provider, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, I agree with everything. I mean, I think that um, some of it is just having these discussions like we're having here today. Um, you know, if I go back even five years ago, talking about, obviously it's been my career choice, but talking about maternal morbidity and mortality, you would never get this many people in a room. I mean, some of that's you, but some of that is also just, it's, it's on everybody's radar. It's on politicians' radar. And I don't quite know... Um, how the tide turned, but it needed to turn because these statistics were terrible before and they're terrible now. Um, so I think conversations like this are really important. I think also um, having diversity in the workforce is really important. I mean, it's obvious that you know we're not a we're I'm sure we're diver very diverse in our opinions, but we're not a particularly diverse panel. Um, not to draw too much attention to that, but I think that as as the next generation, you know, when I go into the medical school class or into the Brown undergrad program and talk to learners, it's way more diverse in terms of experiences, in terms of race, ethnicity, in terms of just, I mean, everything, than the peers that I go and sit with in my office. And I think that's really important. That's going to change the dialogue a little bit um, uh, naturally, and then we have to push to make it change more quickly than it's going to change from that alone. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... I think this is a great way to start, um, and the films are a great way to start, just drawing attention. Terrific. So I think we can get started with some audience questions. I think we have microphones on, on both sides. We'll invite people to come up to ask either of our panelists a, a question. Um, 
Any questions out there? Please. Hello, my name is Stephanie. I, hi, Dr. Werner. <laughs> Hello. Um, my, I did the MPH program here. Um, I'm now a midwife and assistant professor at Boston University. Um, and this is like 85% of my patient population. So um, as, as great as this is and bringing it out there, I think there's still, I think, like you said, we need to talk about it more. Um, but also bringing it, I think, to the communities that are this is happening because I think that they're just aware, like for example, like I said, this is 80% of my population, but what we're doing is a lot of um, centering, so having women do like group prenatal visits where they can learn from each other and see that this is real, like I have diabetes, or what are you taking for your insulin, and they can learn from each other, and I've seen, I've just been amazed at how that has been working as opposed to my one-on-one -on -one, uh, visits. So. Um, I'm interested in, so I grew up in Providence. I want to come back home at some point um, and, and do more teaching, but I want to know what research or what initiatives are being done here in Providence. So I know Providence has a big hub of like Central American, like it's super diverse and I always thought that Rhode Island was small enough where we could make a change. Um, so what is being done in terms of research and uh, like centering programs, do you guys have that in your hospitals or? Great. Um, and I will say, Stephanie just had a baby and you look great. So, um, <laughs> so I think thanks to the Hassenfeld Institute, there's actually a lot, a lot more than was here five years ago, but we still have a long way to go. So um, we have a large prenatal cohort and a birth cohort looking at um, questions of disparities. Um, we actually just got a big grant um, seven million dollars from the NICHD to specifically look at disparities, not just um, in moms, but in, in families. So moms and dads, and then following kids out to a year to figure out, you know, what are we missing? What, what patterns do we not already know about? How do we really translate sort of these population data points into actual interventions where you affect change? Um, I think you're right, Rhode Island's a unique place to, to study, particularly um, his disparities between the Hispanic population or Latino population. Um, and, you know, I, I'm happy to talk more after. I don't, yeah. but we, in terms of centering, I think there's a ton of great work being done on centering. Uh, we're not a particular hub for centering. I wish we were. Some mm -hmm. of that's just physical spaces in clinic. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a bill in front of the state legislature to support doula yeah. care for all for any pregnant woman, not just for privately insured pregnant women, which I think will help bring some of that sort of community knowledge um, into Rhode Island that can be really helpful to pregnant women during their pregnancy. Thank you. Chris, do you want to comment at all about the issue of centering or doulas? Um, I think you mentioned that a yeah, little bit before. Yeah, I mean, centering is awesome, and it's something that you see all over the world now. It's really, um, I mean, it makes sense. People like it. People of any from any community I've seen really gravitate to it once they know that it exists. Um, so we were we showed this, these films at um, Johns Hopkins, and someone had asked there about centering, and um, so it's something somebody had said you should do a film about centering. So I don't know <laughs> yet if we don't have that in the works as we have our next two GBAs coming out. But it's something that I, I think you're right. Like people don't know, or even if they hear about it, they're not as familiar with what it is and what do you it guys means. Know what centering is? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah. Do you, I mean? Sure. So, um, at least in our in our practice, um, centering is we ask women, so we don't just put them all in a hub. We give them a choice, obviously. So, um, it's group prenatal visits. Um, we screen them at their first prenatal visit if they want to be a part of um, really a group prenatal visit. Um, we try to put them together with this with like at least 10 other women that are about the same gestational age and they just come to their visits together and then like we do the measuring of their bellies, listen to the heart tones, they can bring in their entire, we do a lot of um, teaching during these sessions too, so not only do we do the prenatal visit, but each session has like a breastfeeding, we're gonna talk about breastfeeding, the next one will probably be about um, diabetes and pregnancy. So we prep them and, and then we also try to match them with or at least we have a, a doula program too, but it's through a grant, so if they qualify and they don't have any support, it's also a good chance for us to screen them for um, that doula support. Um, and we try to match them with their language, so we have 
a session in Spanish and we have another session for Haitian Creole, so we try to <clears throat> kind of group these. Uh, sadly, not like, well, yes, group them, but it's for their own benefit. Um, so that's what centering is. Yeah. If I miss something, right. you're welcome to add. That's right. You do need space, though, for it, right? Right. But, um, but yeah, it's very intuitive. And, you know, again, it's like we're very focused on women-centered care, patient-centered care. It's that, but then taking the community, like building community or creating community, especially because so many people are going through this by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, either they're, they're living far away from family members or their partner is working somewhere abroad. I mean, people are on their own going through this. And so to have that um, not consistent touch point of care um, is is a huge loss. Um, and so the community-based doulas, um, you know, we've had grantee partners um, all over that have been focused on that work. And it's something that is so effective and also, um, you know, when you're going through pregnancy for anyone, you, you want to be seeing someone who sees you, who respects you, who understands some of the constraints and the barriers you face. And, and doulas tend to work with the people that they serve in their communities and they're familiar and they take the time, they really take the time to get to know like what else is going on, like what, what are all the wraparound needs and services that are lacking here. And it's the best way to kind of, um, to support a woman but then also to be prepared so that when, you know, the, uh, the unexpected complication arises or when an emergency might present itself in, in labor or delivery, like that you already have this understanding of what's going on, what, you know, who are the players, what are the factors, what are we dealing with? I, I think what makes me a little, I think doulas are fabulous, what makes me a little bit sad is that they fill a niche that traditional medicine is sort of failing to do, right? So the average low-risk pregnant woman who sees a, a physician gets 10 minutes every month for the first and second trimester and then 10 minutes every two weeks for the beginning of the third trimester and then 10 minutes every week for the end of the, the third trimester. You know, even if you talk really fast, you can only give, you can only answer that much, you can only listen that much and give out that much information. I'm lucky I get 20 minutes with each of my patients. Um, but it means we have to fill, we have to empower women and give them this education, or we have to change the way healthcare is provided. I think either are great, um, but the, the traditional medical system that we have now just doesn't allow for that sort of shared decision making that we all want. And so the more information that women can get, from you know, we use um, we use a lot of, of nursing education in our practice, but doulas are another great resource, um, and then communities in general, I think, are a, a great resource. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, uh, my name is Carol Shelton. I was a professor of nursing at Rhode Island College, teaching mostly public health, but also always had an advocacy hat and <laughs> was very involved with the Rhode Island Women's Health Collective that was very active here for about 20 years, a number of years ago. I just want to make a couple of comments and maybe I'd like your reaction, response to it. I remember there was an, um, a pamphlet that was produced by the American Nurses Association quite a number of years ago, and it talked about barriers to maternal and child health. And usually when you think of barriers, you're thinking of you know, transportation and child care and all of those things. But there was one barrier that I thought was so important. It was called the institutional barriers to care. And we, we do a good job, I think, sort of with personnel of that greet that are at the desk, that the first person that that new mother is meeting, and that person might be very efficient, but that person may not be welcoming. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that we always do a good job of creating a welcoming mm -hmm. mat for people who are coming, which includes toys for children if they've got their children there. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't have to be a beautiful place, but it ought to be a welcoming place. Mm -hmm or books for the kids, or whatever. So that's just one comment that I think we're, we don't do as good a job as we need to do. Um, the second thing has to do with continuity of care, mm -hmm. something that you were talking about. And um, I did a study a number of years ago in New York City at a, at a hospital that was chiefly it was a it was a a, um, a city hospital, 
And so it was mostly poor people who went there, but it was staffed almost in the maternal and child health place. It was staffed almost always by midwives. And it wasn't a fancy place, but there was a thing in place so that the same person, the same midwife saw that patient literally every single time, with the exception of perhaps vacations. And uh, one of the women that I spoke with was part of it was a qualitative study. She said it's worth waiting for because she knew she was going to be seeing the same person. And I think oftentimes, um, and I know we have to teach students, and, and they oftentimes are not in prenatal care for a whole period of time over a course of a woman's pregnancy. But a woman who might be having mental health problems or a woman who might, have, might be uh, in trouble because of domestic violence mm -hmm. is not going to say to a person that they don't know very well, this is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we worked very hard over the course of the years getting midwives to come to Rhode Island because in the early 1970s there were no midwives in Rhode Island. And part of the advocacy was getting them and getting them li not only licensed, but getting them so that they would get third party payment here in, in the state. And um, I don't think we, you know, when you look at all of the other countries that do so much better than we do, especially the, the, ad, the countries in, in Northern Europe, but all of those places do better than we do. Midwifery is, a, you know, I mean, as a matter of fact, I was speaking with a physician in, um, in England uh, I had a World Health Organization fellowship and was looking at maternal and child health patterns. And this doctor said, he was surprised that doctors, MDs, OBGYNs, do, you know, it's just normal childbearing. It's like, <laughs> that's the job of the midwife. That's mm -hmm. not the job of the doctor. But, you know, we have a totally different system because of its uh, history. But I, I just wish that you'd say something a little bit more maybe about the importance of midwifery or where it's being mm -hmm. done most mm -hmm. successfully, et cetera. Thank you. Sure. Well, I was going to say the first point you made, I think, is one of the things that we have the most opportunity to change, right? Like to make sure that every person that works in a staff or in any environment, that everyone is trained to be um, kind, warm, friendly, welcoming. Because you're right, you may have this small window or just a few windows where you either make someone feel confident in the care they're going to receive or to turn away and never come back. Um, and sometimes that also could is the reason for death. Like people will not seek care even when they need it because they're too fearful about discrimination or judgment. Um, I think midwifery care, I mean, I'm a huge fan. I've had midwives deliver both my children. Um, to me, it is the model of care that I think is, is really the best out there. I think that it's, it's not for everyone, um, but, and there's so few practicing in this country. I mean, when you talk about, I think you're talking mainly about like the UK or Sweden or um, Holland. Those are countries that have some of the best outcomes and they have midwifery totally integrated into the health system, and it's true, every woman has a choice. Um, it's very normal to grow up and have had a midwife, to know your midwife, like it's just, it's just, it's just life. Um, here we have the opposite, and we had that here at some point, and then it really, um, it went away, and we've had a really hard time building the demand up. But with that demand, it's not just demand, because I think more and more people want when they describe what they're looking for what they want that's what they're describing as the midwifery model of care but it doesn't always exist or their insurance doesn't cover it or their state doesn't cover. i mean like there's so many other barriers to getting that kind of care and then that's another problem because to know about something and then not to have access to it is is you know very frustrating um, and it seems odd for a high-risk obstetrician to say, I, I fully think most babies should be delivered by midwives, but I do. <laughs> um, uh, I would hate to not do another vaginal, normal vaginal delivery, but that's okay. Um, I, just my own experience with my second child, I wanted to have a midwife, and my insurance company wouldn't pay for any of the practices, so I was forced to go to a, a I actually went to the residence and they delivered me. But, um, <laughs> but um, to get to what uh, you said, initially I actually think the way I've worked at many of I think 
some of the best hospitals in the north northeast and i would say even though it, most of the providers from the front desk staff to the the physicians wanted to be welcoming it's actually a minority that are welcoming and i think we're actually getting worse not better as we add more and more pressure um, and then in terms of continuity i think we're also getting worse not better i think that if you compare it to 20 years ago there's less continuity not more so i think your your points are all really well taken and i think are things that you know they may be part of the reason to explain our rising morbidity and mortality rates rather than falling or is there a way to address that? Are there things you're seeing in other parts of the country or with your colleagues to be, how do you get to welcoming and continuity? I think, so where I did fellowship, the high risk, um, the MFM group, um, we were paired with a group of private midwives and it was actually a really great model. They took care of a lot and just their model was they had a lot more time with patients. I think midwifery care is one way to address it. I think doulas are another way to address it. And then I think, um, Hospitals have to, you know, you have to apply pressure and they have to be made aware of this and then they redesign staff education and it becomes a focus. And we're doing that now. It'll probably take five years. Um, but, you know, my hope is eventually when you walk into a hospital that they not only say hi and smile, but that they ask you, you know, you know, at the end, did we meet your needs? What didn't we answer? Um, I think we're a long way from that, as are most of the major academic medical centers across the country. But I think conversations like this um, put some of the pressure on and some of the focus. But I think any injury in industry that is consumer driven, you have an opportunity to to make like to <laughs> to make a change yeah. based on your feedback, based on your rating, based on the scorecards. Um, I mean, there's a big gap too with just surveying. I mean, I've had a number of women explain that they've had a baby and the hospital will send them a survey, but you, you it doesn't make matter whether you had your knee replaced or you had a baby, that the questions they're asking have nothing to do with the actual experience that they're having. And so how can the hospital get better? How can the staff get better if there's not that direct line of communication and that feedback loop? So that's something, that's another easy thing. Um, but it's not implemented as, as, as widely as it should be, yeah. or standardized. Really good point. Our next question. Hi, um, I'm Megan, I'm an undergrad here at Brown. Um, EMC does so much amazing work from um, grants and research to lobbying to these films. Um, I'm just wondering how you decide to spend your resources, how you pick projects, and what you decide to commit yourself to. Thank you. Um, well, we started off with the film and then became an organization, and um, it took us a little while to figure out, like, advocacy was one of the first goals, right? To, people don't know that this is a problem. Let's just, like, let's, small a, let's talk about what the problem is and let's, um, let's try to get people to be informed so they can start to ask and demand. And um, there wasn't a huge appetite for advocacy when we started. <laughs> there were a few bills that were introduced that we supported, and I was so excited. <laughs> like, there's this great opportunity in 2009. And things just kind of stuck. Like, Congress was not moving anything on women's health. And so two of those bills passed at the end of this last year, weirdly. Um, it took <laughs> 10 years, but that's when they came through. And now there are about 10 pretty pretty important bills that are going around. There's one that's incredibly, like, I mean, we're not supposed to pick favorites, but there's one that's very <laughs> comprehensive because they've actually been able to, you know, in that time, in that 10 year span, there's so much more information and nuance to what will make a difference. And so each one that gets written is to kind of like fill other gaps. And I think you're, they're starting to paint a better picture about what all is needed. Um, so that's important. There's this appetite now and opportunity. I think because the elevation of the stories is taking some time, but there is now, I mean, really every major newspaper has covered this issue. It's been on Grey's Anatomy. It's in People Magazine. <laughs> it's, I mean, the ProPublica series, like beyond for a year of reporting on more than 700 women's stories, but they actually had something like 2,500 stories. So um, there, there's a lot out there, and I think that's the perfect time to then translate that into law. Um, so I, we're feeling pretty hopeful about some of the things that exist out there that were reintroduced recently. There's a few of the Democratic candidates who um, have actually introduced or um, 
like reintroduce pieces of law this year. And we've been doing a lot of, um, we just started to do editorial boards to inform um, the media so that when there's an event like the debate tonight, we're hoping, watch tonight because we're hoping that a recent editorial board that we did, and we gave questions to be able to say what to ask, there's no guarantees, <laughs> um, but it hasn't been brought in, up in any debate yet. Healthcare has, but not maternity care. So with three experts on the stage they who can answer those questions and have been focused on the issue, I think it could be a great opportunity. But if it doesn't happen tonight, it will happen. It will happen this year. Um, and I think we just have to keep, you know, as much as we can, keep stirring the pot, keep telling people to ask, if they go to any of those town halls or events, to raise your hand and ask the candidates, whomever you get close to, what, what are you going to do about this? What's going on? You know? Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Question over here. Hi. Uh, my name is Deep. I am a faculty community and public health promotion in Rhode Island College. Uh, I actually, first of all, thanks for the amazing work. So my question is, uh, has there been a recent change based on your experience uh, with regards to the, so off late there has been some focus, even if not official rule, uh, to bring in uh, from the federal level to welcome immigrants who are quote unquote more wealthy, although that may, be, may not be the exact word that was stated. So more wealthy and those who are less dependent on benefits. Now, I was wondering if that was having an impact or is already having an impact on both uh, documented and undocumented immigrants' uh, enrollment in the WIC program or using the advantages of WIC because if I understand correctly and I could be wrong, I think a lot of uh, people, if they were, there was one uh, benefit program that they would use, any families, that would be the woman, infants, and child, because there was no uh, requirement of citizenship or residency, I think. It was just uh, show that you were uh, a resident of that state. So, uh, but this recent focus has seems to have created a lot of doubts in the mind of both documented and undocumented immigrants. So I was wondering if you have experienced any of that and if you have found ways to maybe bypass, bypass that. Thank you. I don't know about bypassing. I don't know, that, I don't know any data that's come up yet because um, it's so hard to get data in real time that actually really tells us what's going on. But I will say in the last 10 years or so, I, even before this current administration, even before the crisis we're going through with undocumented people, um, people would not seek care in some instances because of fear. So it takes time, whether there's good services and adequate services being offered or whether they're not there, it takes time for that word to spread mm -hmm. and to get into the communities for people to know what what is right, what am I eligible for, um, what will, ha will I be penalized? Mm -hmm. You know, like, there's a lot of fear. I mean, I think Ileana's story articulates this really well. Um, she's been in the States for about 10 years at this point and she, she's been living in fear her whole life. But now, of course, there's raids in her children's schools and there's raids in the fields. Um, so there's a whole other level and you can imagine, right, any pregnancy, you know, your, your, you know any change that happens in your life during pregnancy is a potential real risk factor. And you can imagine, like, having that entire period of your life pregnant with a family to support under those under that stress and those circumstances and the impact of that stress and those stressors on the baby on the mother long term health wise i mean it's just it's 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 really awful um so i don't foresee and maybe you would both know better but i'm not foreseeing that we're going to see the impact of that immediately, it's gonna, like everything else, it takes like 10 years before you get, I mean, five yeah, years, 10 years? Yeah, at least, and I think to change the, I mean, I think what's unique about Ileana is that she actually sought care. I mm -hmm. think for every person that seeks care, there's 20 who wouldn't have ever gotten pregnant because they, because it's scary, you know, just to go see a doctor. 
Um, and I think to, for WIC, it's the same thing. So we hear, I hear from providers in Rhode Island, but also all across the country, there are especially clinics that serve big immigrant populations. People asking for WIC numbers are down. You know, these are all, these are qualitative reports, not quantitative mm -hmm. reports. But, you know, um, Providence Community Health Centers, they'll tell you that, like, they, after, cert, after a raid anywhere in New England, they have fewer patients show up for a prenatal visit the next day. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's real for patients. Um, and I suspect WIC would be the same. Um, because I'm not sure that if you're somebody who's getting services that you necessarily differentiate which, which mm -hmm. place um, you're at risk. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Becky Smeltzer and I just um, received my MPH or Master's in Public Health um, from Boston University, which is funny. <laughs> um, and I'm currently in the application process for PhD programs in epi and um, maternal child health specifically. But one of the things that I'm really interested in researching and being based in Massachusetts is more of these um, life course factors um, and chronic disease and everything that happens that affects people um, specifically in this time period of pregnancy and postpartum. Um, and I did a project on the Massachusetts Maternal Mortality Review Committee where we looked at all these cases of death within pregnancy and first year of life. And in Massachusetts specifically, there's huge um, numbers um, of deaths due to substance use mm -hmm. and whether they were um, during pregnancy or just surrounding that time. And I think this is um, a chronic disease and something that affects the life course that really could, could need, it may need some more light shown on it. So I was wondering if you um, have any plans in the future for looking at this as something um, that you would delve into or, or highlight. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, we don't have any immediate plans for it, but it comes up more and more right now. Um, I've been watching some of the new guidelines that ACOG has been putting out there around even marijuana use in pregnancy, mm -hmm. which really I didn't, people weren't asking those questions five years ago, but now it's a real issue and there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot of confusion, I think, around you know, what people can do, what they can't do. And, and again, that's another issue where women are very fearful um, about whether they admit to that usage or not, depending on, again, what state you live in. Um, so I, I think that there's definitely a lot there for a film. I mean, we have our next, our, 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 we just finished our sixth film, which is in New Mexico and focuses on um, a, a Navajo population. Um, an Navajo midwife who's trying to open a birth center um, for um, Native women. And that's just finished, so it should come out later this year. And then we're starting research on um, Giving Birth in America, Texas next. And it will most likely be around the border crisis. Um, but I think beyond that, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, and that's certainly an, an, an issue that I think demands exploration. And that's part of what it is like the, the place often dictates the, where we go next and then where we have relationships and networks and a good, um, a good group of like experts that are, um, that are on the front lines. Um, and I, I've met some people focus on this issue, but not as many people that are like leading the charge in that issue. So I think I need to, I need to meet more, but I think it's a really important area of, um, of research and there's a lot of need there. I think it's a great place for you to, to put your time into. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Do either of you want to comment? I mean, part of where that light was shown, you're saying, is from these maternity um, mortality review Reviews. committees. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to comment about that? I, I think one of the things that we owe a great debt to you is, is shining the light through these films and this advocacy. And it seems like the other way to be doing this is through, through data. Do, do either mm -hmm. of you want to talk about that? So they just passed, um, we will now have one in Rhode Island, which is really exciting. The problem in Rhode Island is that we're such a small state that there aren't that many, thank thankfully. Um, so first of all, maybe you should explain what maternal mortality review committees are. So we'll start there. So basically they are um, mandated by the state that every maternal death be explored. Um, and so it's a panel of public health experts and clinical experts that come together to review the causes, um, and not just immediate causes, but systemic causes and patterns of um, things that led up to a maternal death. 
Um, and so in Rhode Island, we're lucky in that we don't have that many maternal deaths. So I think the review committee, hopefully, the, the right now the plan is, and I hope it will stay this way, that we're also going to look at near misses and morbidities. So moms who got really sick during their pregnancy or in the first year of postpartum. Um, and I think what, what those committees are really wonderful for is they let you systematically look at every critically ill woman in Rhode Island and come up with, you know, are there opportunities that, that were missed that we could take advantage of? You might miss that pattern if you just look at one case. But if you have the same group of people looking at every case over the course of a few years, then you pick up patterns like the opioid crisis um, and how that, you know, maybe those women were not using during their pregnancy and you otherwise would have missed it. But when you look at all of the deaths in the first year postpartum, then you pick up um, things like, you know, other risk factors that women had. So, I mean, I'm, I'm optimistic that it may help us in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. It definitely will. I mean, this is something, one of the bills that passed at the end of 2018 was about having maternal mortality reviews in every state. And it's something that CDC had had started to do and then the funding just didn't wasn't consistent we had a great one in New York and then that funding fell out and now it's just been reinstated um, so there will be a lot more accurate data I think as a result of this but I think it's also just the consistent way of looking at things and then you know it's 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 that used to all be different too like the death certificates in each state and that like you you can't know anything if you're counting a maternal death, like some are counting it 30 days after, some are counting it 90 days after. There's one bill right now that it's looking to extend postpartum care for a whole year. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but right now, six weeks, I mean, like for Medi-Cal, which is one of the better ones, I mean, I think 30 days after delivery, right, you, there's, no, there's no more care. Um, most of these deaths are happening postpartum, and so when you know that, it's, it just emphasizes how important it is to continue as long as you can um, care for mom. Hi, my name is Alice Hamlet. I'm a master's student at the School of Public Health here at Brown. Speaking to new ventures and also to the message that every mother counts, can either of you speak a little bit to, in either a policy or practice lens, any progress that's being made or has been made to serve uh, incarcerated mothers with holistic and affirming care? Great question. That's another film, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think. I think it is. A number of states have enacted laws to unshackle women during labor because it's really hard to push a baby out if you're tied to a bed. Um, you know, I, I, it's a great point, and I don't think enough is being done. Um, I know a, a lot, almost... There, most states have a mandate to provide prenatal care, including ultrasounds, to all pregnant, incarcerated women. Um, in my clinical experience, the problems really come in labor um, because getting women to the hospital in a timely fashion, particularly if they've had multiple babies before, um, and then once they're there, providing care that's that's typical. Um, I don't know what the laws in Rhode Island are. I know there was there was a bill. On the in the legislature last year, um, but I think it didn't go anywhere. Um, if I remember correctly, is that is that correct? Do you know? I, yeah, I think yeah. There was some recently, yeah. Yeah. There's a great organization called National Advocates for Pregnant Women, and this is one of their main areas of focus. They're based out of New York, um, and that's where I first learned that it exists. And at that at the time that I learned about it, it was that most states it. They, they weren't supposed to be able to do this anymore, and yet you keep hearing and reading about stories where this has happened and where women are not only shackled, but um, they're, they're not given water. <laughs> you need, like, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, just, it's just beyond cruel and unusual punishment, and um, there's absolutely no reason for it. Um, but I'm not sure, like, state to state, again, I think it's very inconsistent with what is permitted and what is not permitted or how to go about it. I know Kamala Harris is focused on this generally. Um, I'm not sure if the bill that she um, introduced for maternity care, if it includes that component or not. Um, but she's the one that I think is very focused on incarcerated people and their rights. Any questions? As our time is coming close to the end, I, I want to pick up on what you just said. Uh, we obviously are entering election season or, <laughs> or well into it. Um, 
as we're shining this light on this critical issue, what, what should that we have people here, what should people be focused on this year um, to take this opportunity to try to make a difference on this issue? I mean, I think have those conversations with your peers and your friends. Um, if you found the film to be helpful, there are others. They're free. They're on our website, everymothercounts.org. Um, you know, there also are these 10 pieces of legislation that are around these bills, and they all are quite interesting, and we have a Take Action page also on our website. Um, but I think, you know, when you watch or when you're participating in, you know, this is like, this is all going to impact us all um, quite seriously. And so I think to be able to, whether it's through social media, whether it's writing to your members, I mean, those things, they actually really do work. Um, you know, even an actual knock on the door is the best way, but all, all of our members will take your meetings, they will take your calls, and I, I just encourage you, as, as much as that might not feel um, effective at times, right now it truly is, and obviously voting, I mean, <laughs> um, when these things matter to you, um, sharing that they matter to you is really important. There's a lot of issues that our representatives um, are dealing with and thinking about, and so when they hear from audiences that this is something that they care about, um, it certainly does make a difference, and it goes higher up on their priorities. Yeah, I, I agree with everything. And I think particularly for those of you, although I think Massachusetts is friendly to this too, but in Rhode Island, it's very small. I moved here six years ago, and this was the first place where I've met with congressmen and senators, and they are very receptive to just you know, going and knocking on their doors and, and telling them what you ma what matters to you, going to them, they, a lot of them hold like town halls, going and asking questions about maternal mor morbidity and mortality issues or healthcare in general. Um, so I think we have a little bit of an advantage in Rhode Island that we should take advantage of. Um, before I have you do any last words, I just wanna do a few uh, thank yous. Uh, first to, to Christy for all the work that you're doing and for coming here to bring the work to us. We're really very grateful. Um, Christy needs to leave right, right after the panel, but the rest of us will be able to spend some time in the reception to uh, answer any questions and hopefully continue some of the discussion. Um, while we're saying thank you, um, Patricia Lansing really uh, planted the seeds for this and made some connections that, that made this happen. And everyone out of Every Mother Counts, particularly Kat Grimes, who's really uh, helped pull this together, and the School of Public Health, our Dean Bess Marcus for supporting this, uh, but Karen Scanlon, uh, uh, Kate Ellis, and everybody who made the, this day happen. We really want to thank everybody. Um, any last words for the, the group while you're here uh, before we break up? Thank you for coming. This is great. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you, thank you all for coming. Um, we also just have to give a plug because, um, I mean, why not? You're acting yes, for actions yes. and activities. Why we invited you? <laughs> um, people who are active physically and like to run or anything, we do a lot of the way that we mobilize um, supporters of our organization of this issue is through running, um, running and other health-oriented events. Um, so marathons, we've had a lot of people, all of the people here that, um, that know me and have come with me, they've all been <laughs> made to run miles. I think it's all to elevate the, the, distance of the distance barrier, which is sometimes measured in miles and sometimes not. Um, and then also, you know, we we partner with a lot of other companies um, to create products that benefit the programs that we invest in all over the world. Um, and so that's another way to participate if the, what you heard here today is of interest. Um, yeah. Thank you. So please go to the Every Mother's Count website. And, and one last thank you to our panelists.